So in this video, I'm going to talk about DNA in the Book of Mormon. This is a complicated topic. There's a lot of sub-issues, um, and I'll link to lots of things on, for the video, but I'm just going to focus on the most critical issues here, and I'm hoping at the end of this video you'll, you'll be very upset about anyone that uses this as a criticism of the Book of Mormon. So uh, the, the biggest issue, or the po population geneticists have a, a strong uh, view that uh, the population of America, uh, ancient population, came from um, Asia, uh, through from Siberia over the land bridge called Beringia in the last ice age, probably 15 to 17,000 BC. And that's where the population came from. And if there's other uh, genetic markers here that, uh, from other areas, they think it was post uh, Columbus, post 1492 uh, AD. So I'm going to go through a bunch of different issues uh, with this, but I will start with uh, really, I think, maybe the biggest issue, um, and that is that there was a group of 30 to 50 people uh, in Lehi's party that came, and science says that there were, there were several million people here, um, would be the estimates today, at, in 600 B.C., so our biggest critic um, on this specific issue actually wrote about this, um, said in 600 B.C. there were probably several million American Indians living in the Americas. If a small group of Israelites entered such a massive native population, it would be very, very hard to detect their genes 200, 2,000, or even 20,000 years later. But does such a scenario fit with what the Book of Mormon plainly states or what the prophets have taught for 175 years? Short answer, no. Notice how this is flipped over to a theological issue than a scientific issue, but he acknowledges the point that uh, uh, Lehi's DNA would be completely absolved in the uh, larger population. I'll talk about more of why that would happen in a minute. Uh, but what is the church's official position on this? Well, the church really has not had an official position um, until really recently on this, and it, it's a part of the Gospel Topics essay, uh, DNA in the Book of Mormon. If you look specifically uh, here on the screen, what seems clear is that the DNA uh, of Book of Mormon peoples likely represented only a fraction of all DNA in ancient America. Joseph Smith appears to have been open to the ideas of migrations other than those described in the Book of Mormon, that's in Times and Seasons, uh, September 1842, and many Latter-day Saint leaders and scholars over the past century have found the Book of Mormon account to be fully consistent with the presence of other established populations. A 2006 update to the introduction of the Book of Mormon reflects this understanding by stating that Book of Mormon peoples were among the ancestors of the American Indians. Now, um, some additional detail on that. A church statement when this wording change happened in 2006 from principal to among. On the screen here, you'll see the introduction, which is not part of the text of the Book of Mormon, previously stated that the Lamanites were the principal ancestors of the American Indians. Even this statement, first published in 1981, implies the presence of others. Early in the Book of Mormon, the name Lamanite refers to the descendants of Laman and Lemuel. Hundreds of years later, it came to identify all those with a different political or religious affiliation than the keepers of the Book of Mormon plates. In fact, if you look at 4th Nephi, uh, verse 20, um, it actually states um, there, let me get to that. Uh, there were still there was still peace in the land, save it were a small part of the people who had revolted from the church and taken upon them the name of Lamanites. Therefore, there began to be Lamanites again in the land. So these were the people that opposed Christ and the church. And essentially, if you think about it, in 1492 when Columbus landed, that was there. There were no Christians here, as evidence shows, at that time. And by that definition, they were all Lamanites um, in that sense. Now, um, uh, one other uh, criticism is of what Moroni told Joseph. So Joseph, writing this 15 years later in Joseph Smith history, verse 34, he talked about what Moroni said. He said about the golden plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent and the source from which they sprang whence they sprang. So I can see how critics could, could argue uh, that, but I think you could all also argue that it's talking about the people that were in the Book of Mormon, the, the inhabitants uh, that were discussed there and from where they came from. Um, so I don't think there's a problem there. Also, here's a, here's a great quote from um, what, clear back in 1929 in General Conference from uh, Anthony Ivins of the First Presidency. He said, we must be careful in the conclusions that we reach. The Book of Mormon does not tell us that there was no one here before them, the peoples it describes. It does not tell us the people did not come after. 
Now, what does the Book of Mormon say itself, the text? And I'm going to link to this. This is an excellent paper, 34 pages, uh, from John Sorensen. When Lehi's party arrived in the land, did they find others there? The Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. Fantastic piece, lots of detail uh, there. Um, I will share just a couple of my favorites when I think about this. I think uh, the lost 116 pages had on it the more secular history of the people. And we probably would have gotten some more details there, but this was a spiritual record, the small plates of Nephi. And Nephi doesn't really mention anything about the, uh, the land. They talk about when they left Laman and Lemuel's group, he says that he took all the people and he names them all. And then he says, and all who would come with me. Then when, when uh, Nephi dies, Jacob talks about uh, the people will be called Nephites that are fr uh, friendly to Nephi. That's the, the criteria um, there that would be called Nephites um, there. Then uh, Jacob, this is probably my favorite, Jacob 2, he, he um, calls them to repentance, the men for having concubines, which in the Old Testament was often uh, labeled as foreign wives. But... Uh, where would these have come from? <laughs> there, remember this is the, this is Nephi's brother Jacob that we're talking about. This is the first group really uh, there. Where would these concubines have come from? Then Sherem in Jacob seven, Sherem the Antichrist comes on the scene, and he comes out of nowhere. He says uh, essentially um, that he had sought Jacob much to talk to him. Um, if it was a small village, that wouldn't necessarily be the case. He also says they had a perfect knowledge of their language. Why would you say that about a group of a couple hundred people? You all would be speaking the same thing. Very um, interesting. So again, reading between the lines, if you're looking for others, there's 34 pages here of detail. It's all over the place um, there. So now the big reason why this is untestable is we do not have Lehi's body. It's like, think of it as like a, a sandbox and Lehi is, is one grain of sand. Well, even if you were to find that grain of sand, you wouldn't even know if you had the right thing because you don't have Lehi's DNA. Um, and, and if you think about it, Lehi was not from the tribe of Judah. He was not a Jew per se. Even if you were to go back to 600 BC, have DNA from Jerusalem of that time, did, Le did Lehi have representative DNA from that period for, for that specific, uh, for, a, for a Jew, if you will? So Lehi was from the tribe of Manasseh. Ishmael was from the tribe of Ephraim. This, they were from Joseph. That was part of the lost 10 tribes taken captive by the Assyrians 120 years earlier. So who knows what their DNA looked like? They didn't contribute to the, the DNA for that area, essentially. Um, so it, it's very hard to, to label this. Also, if you think about Jerusalem at that time, was a crossroads, three continents, very a hotbed of change, lots of intermarriage, uh, um, uh, mingling, uh, immigration that was happening. Also, if you look at modern uh, Jews, their DNA don't really doesn't match well with ancient. Uh, DNA uh, samples, if you will. Um, and there's even a lot of confusion within uh, what does Jewish DNA look like? Here's a piece from the New York Times in 2002. A new study now shows that the women in nine Jewish communities from Georgia to Morocco have vastly different genetic histories from the men. The women's identities, however, are a mystery because their genetic signatures are not related to one another or to those of present-day Middle Eastern populations. Also, we have a founder, what's called the founder effect. Um, this is critical in having the DNA of the founder of a population. This is from the Gospel Topics essay. It says, Descendants might inherit a genetic profile that would be unexpected given their family's place of origin. This phenomenon is called the founder effect. Consider the case of Dr. Hugo A. Pereiro, a Latter-day Saint population geneticist. His genealogy confirms that he is a multi-generational Italian, but the DNA of his paternal genetic lineage is from a branch of the Asian Native Hap American Hapla group C. This likely means that somewhere along the line, a migratory event from Asia to Europe led to the introduction of DNA atypical of Perogo's place of origin. If Perogo and his family were to colonize an isolated landmass, future geneticists conducting a study of his descendants' Y chromosomes might conclude that the original settlers of that landmass were from Asia rather than Italy. This hypothetical story shows that conclusions about the genetics of a population must be informed by a clear understanding of the DNA of the population's founders. In the case of the Book of Mormon, clear information of that kind is, is unavailable. Now, another huge issue that comes in uh, being, a, not, uh, being able to test well is genetic drift. If you look at this picture, this is straight out of the Gospel Topics essay, this visual here. 
Um, if you were to fill a jar with 20 marbles, 10 red, 10 blue, the jar represents a population and the marbles represent people with different genetic profiles. Draw a marble at random from the population, record its color, and place it back in the jar. Each jar represents the birth of a child. Draw 20 times to simulate a new generation within the population. The second generation could have an equal number of each color, but more likely it will have an uneven number of the two colors. Now, before you draw a third generation, adjust the proportion of each color in the jar to reflect the new mix of genetic profiles in the gene pool. As you continue drawing, the now uneven mix will lead to even more frequent draws of the dominant color. Over several generations, this drift toward one color will almost certainly result in the disappearance of the other color. And in fact, if you, if you were to look back 10 generations, you'd have 1,024 ancestors, but only about 12% of the DNA would flow through. In fact, there was a big study in Iceland done of the genealogy and the genetics of the DNA. And they found over 300 years that um, all the people that were in Iceland came from a very tiny, small subset of those that were there 300 years ago. In fact, there were 95 mummies that were found in the Andes um, not long ago, and they were able to do DNA studies and found that they had nothing to do with the people that were there in the Andes today, and they attributed it to genetic drift. Look at this quote on the screen from uh, uh, Beth Shook and David Smith in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology in 2008, genetic drift has been a significant force on Native American genetics and together with a major population crash after European contact has altered haplogroup, haplogroup frequencies and caused the loss of many haplotypes. Speaking of the, the population crash, if you look at this uh, uh, picture here, population bottleneck, this is straight out of the Gospel Topics essay as well. If you look, due to a dramatic reduction in population, some genetic profiles represented in the picture here, yellow, orange, green, and purple circles, are lost. Subsequent generations inherit only the DNA of the survivors. In addition to the catastrophic war at the end of the Book of Mormon, the European conquest of the Americas in the 15th and 16th centuries touched off just such a cataclysmic chain of events. As a result of war and the spread of disease, many Native American groups experienced devastating population losses. One molecular anthropologist observed that the conquest squeezed the entire American population through a genetic bottleneck. He concluded this population re reduction has forever altered the genetics of the surviving groups, thus complicating any attempts at reconstructing the pre-Columbian genetic structure of most New World groups. Estimates are that the European conquest and the diseases actually eliminated about 80 to 90 percent of the Native American population. So this, that was a significant population bottleneck um, a problem uh, there t today in the testing. Um, so if you were to, just the last couple of, uh, some quick quotes from the Gospel Topics essay. Additional DNA markers from Europe, West Asia, and Africa exist in the DNA of modern native populations, but it's difficult to determine whether they are the result of migrations that pre predated Columbus, such as those described in the Book of Mormon, or whether they stem from genetic mixing that occurred after the European conquest. This is due in part to the fact that the molecular clock used by scientists to date Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA markers is not sufficiently sensitive to pinpoint the timing of migrations that occurred as recently as a few hundred or even a few thousand years ago. Moreover, no molecular clock is currently available for complete genomes. And last, scientists do not rule out the possibility of additional small-scale uh, migrations to the Americas. In fact, there's a quote there from Stanford University a professor. He says, models that suggest a single one-time migration are generally regarded as idealized system. There may be, have been small amounts of migrations going on for millennia. In fact, uh, Science Magazine uh, did a piece last uh, in 2017. Um, if you look on the screen here, the title, Most Archaeologists Think That the First Americans Arrived by Boat. Now they're beginning to prove it. So kind of an interesting piece. I'll link to that article uh, there. And that's from an archaeological perspective rather than a genetics uh, DNA perspective. Now, if you were to truly test uh, this and be able to test it, I love what Dr. Prego in a paper about what you would need. Um, and the, the, you'd have to answer the following questions, these six questions. What did the DNA of the Book of Mormon people look like? What is the typical DNA found in the population of Jerusalem in 600 BC? Can their DNA be differentiated from the Europeans arriving after 1492? Is the current molecular clock adequate to discern pre from post-Columbian genetic contributions to the new world within the last 3,000 years? 
Uh, fifth, what degree of mixture did the Nephites and our Lamanites experience with local natives? And six, how long were the Nephites and our Lamanites in isolated population after their arrival to the American continent? Obtaining answers to these questions would enable the design of research that could contribute to our understanding of the Book of Mormon as a historical record from a scientific approach. Without such information, we risk forming conclusions based on personal interpretation and biased assumptions. And in fact, um, the uh, conclusion of the Gospel Topics essay is fairly strong about this. It says, much as critics and defenders, so notice, and defenders of the Book of Mormon, would like to use DNA studies to support their views, the evidence is simply inconclusive. Nothing is known about the DNA of Book of Mormon peoples. Even if such information were known, processes such as population bottleneck, genetic drift, and post-Columbian immigration from West Eurasia would make it unlikely that their DNA could be detected today. As the Elder Dalen H. Oaks of the Twelve observed, it is our position that secular evidence can neither prove nor disprove the authenticity of the Book of Mormon. And as far as defenders of the Book of Mormon in this, they talk about this haplogroup X that was found in the Great Lakes area. Um, and I won't go into a lot, but I will link to Dr. Perego, who says this is a very, very, he has a very strong opinion that this could not be the case, that this is uh, very old DNA. Uh, it's part of the Kinnewick Man that was found um, along the Columbia River, and uh, it's dated back to 9000 BC, the, the bones, uh, carbon dating uh, there. And the X2A specifically is not found in the Middle East area um, there, which is the specific uh, uh, type of DNA in the, in the Great Lakes area. So I'll link, I'll link to that. There's some things there. But again, the church says, don't, let's not, um, the same arguments could apply to the defenders. All the stuff I've talked about in this video, same, same challenges either way. I love what Elder Neil I. Maxwell said in his book, Plain and Precious Things. It is the author's opinion that all the scriptures, including the Book of Mormon, will remain in the realm of faith. Science will not be able to prove or disprove holy writ. However, enough plausible evidence will come forth to prevent scoffers from having a field day, but not enough to remove the requirement of faith. Believers must be patient during such unfolding. So I love that. And there is, it does feel sometimes like there's a double standard with Christians uh, knocking down the Book of Mormon from a scientific perspective on this stuff when in the same realm with the Bible there's no way to scientifically prove with DNA or archaeological evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as an example or the exodus or the flood some of these types of things uh, they are the, the believers um, don't don't need science to, to prove for their faith. I wanted to close with a quote from President Hinckley in the February 2004 Ensign where he said the, about the Book of Mormon, the evidence for its truth, for its validity, in a world that is prone to demand evidence, lies not in archaeology or anthropology, though these may be helpful to some. It lies not in word research, research or historical analysis, though these may be confirmatory. The evidence for its truth and validity lies within the covers of the book itself. The test of its truth lies in reading it. It is a book of God. Reasonable people may sincerely question its origin, but those who have read it prayerfully have come to know by a power beyond their natural senses that it is true that it contains the word of God, that it outlines saving truths of the everlasting gospel, that it came forth by the gift and power of God to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. Hope you enjoyed the video and subscribe for more.